You've often spoken about your belief that narrowing racial disparities is not the same as improving society. Is there any extent to which you think narrowing racial disparities is in and of itself useful? Why and how big of a priority, if so? Okay, this is a great question. And I'm, I'm going to have an extended discussion of this exact question in my forthcoming book, which all signs point to being finished this year. I would argue that equal outcomes between races are not inherently good. They are not good in and of themselves. And I would also argue that if you disagree with that claim, you actually haven't thought about it long enough or in the right way. I will use a cliche example, but I think it's cliche for a reason. Nobody cares that the NBA is three-fourths black in its racial makeup. Nobody cares. Black people don't care. White people don't care. Asians don't care. Hispanics don't care. Jews don't care. Nobody is offended by that massive disparity. Here are some other disparities that I, I can guarantee almost no one in the world is offended by. Um, Chinese Americans make far more money every year than Thai Americans. Ghanaian Americans make far more money every year than Ethiopian Americans. Russian Americans make far more money every year than French Americans, although that might not be true this year. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I could... I could do an hour-long podcast simply reciting facts of this kind, disparities of this kind that nobody cares about and, and that we're right not to care about. So that is all to say that equal outcomes aren't even really the goal sought by people who claim to care about it in general, right? So what gives here? What is it that people are being dishonest or people just haven't thought through the issue enough? Well, it's, it's partly the second thing, but it's also that when people claim to care about equal outcomes without realizing it, what they really care about is whether the process by which those outcomes were reached is a fair process. So let me tell you the reason why people don't care that the NBA is three quarters black whereas black people only represent 12, 13% of the population. The reason people don't care about that disparity is because everyone knows that the process of getting to the NBA is as pure a meritocracy as has ever existed in almost any human domain. It's like as close to meritocracy as human systems could reasonably get. They know that the very best basketball players reliably end up in the NBA, regardless of their skin color. And so, because we know the process is fair, we actually don't care what the outcome is. When people start claiming to care about the equality of the outcome, what's actually behind that concern, what's motivating it, unacknowledged, is a sense that the system might be unfair that the system might be taking factors into account, such as race, which are arbitrary and unfairly penalizing certain individuals and not others as a result of traits that they cannot control. People worry that the prison system, for instance, is not fair. And there, there's no doubt it's nowhere near as fair as, as the NBA. I don't think even the staunchest defenders of, of the criminal justice system would allege that. I mean, for one thing, to be rich is to in, in experience an entirely different criminal justice system uh, than to be poor. When people start, when people claim to worry about results, what they're actually motivated by, I would argue, is a concern that the process is not fair. It is the process we ultimately care about. And if we could be guaranteed that the process was fair, if it were transparently obvious that the process is fair, such as it is in most sports. Suddenly, we just stop caring about whether the results are equal, right? Nobody cares if, you know, five spelling bee winners in a row are Indian. Nobody cares because it's, it's so clearly a pure competition, a competition devoid of any bias. 
So the moment we can be assured that the process is fair, we stop caring about the results. And that's a very, I think it's a deep insight into human psychology and what we actually care about deep down versus what we claim to care about. So one thing we really care about is fairness, which gets mistranslated into, into caring about equal outcomes when it's really about the process. But um, another thing we care about is progress. We want, we want to feel like we are doing better than our parents were, that we have more opportunity, more wealth, um, that it, it is easier to be healthy, that um, we are living in safer times. In many ways, the project of civilization is to safeguard the institutions that allow for reliable progress. So we care about fairness on the one hand, and we care about progress on the other. So how does this fit in to the goal of closing the gaps, which is obviously all the rage and is is behind almost every article you've ever read, read that mentions a black-white outcome gap, whether that is in health or wealth or incarceration. The implication behind that way of framing the issue is that to close the gaps would be to make the kind of progress we should care about. But again, I would argue, first of all, we do not care about gaps in, in, in themselves, and we are right to not care about gaps in themselves when you think through the issue fully. What we should care about are the metrics that have something to do with actually increasing flourishing for humans. One thing that increases flourishing is when processes are, fa are fair and when we know they're fair. And another thing that increases human flourishing is when we are progressing on all of the metrics that we care about, you know, life expectancy and income and wealth and, and all the rest. So this obsession with closing gaps is much more superficial than it appears. For instance, you could close all of these gaps simply by making white people worse off. As a thought experiment, just consider if we just took wealth away from white people and incarcerated more and more white people until the metrics looked the same uh, between blacks and whites. At the same time, we would have created a more equal and worse world. The variables of equality and human flourishing are, are orthogonal to one another, in, in my view. They are just two separate goals. You, to pursue one at some point is to, is to go against the other, right? Because they're just not the same thing. And too much of our discourse assumes that they are. So, you know, so my preferred way of thinking about progress is this way. When I think of whether my family has made progress, common sense would say I compare my life to my dad's and my mom's and ultimately I compare my life to my grandparents and I just notice how many more opportunities I had than he had. How much easier certain things were for me than for him as a result of the engine of technological progress, the expansion of full citizen, citizenship rights to black Americans, uh, and so forth. Uh, the decline of wars in general, which is a strange thing to say as, uh, as Mariupol is getting bombed, but the general decline of, of wars as testified in, in books like Steven Pinker's. Why is it that when we think about groups, we don't use the same paradigm? Why is it that you will never see an article that rather than comparing average black statistics today to average white stats today, instead compares, instead asks the question, how are black people doing today as, opposed, as compared with how they were doing 20, 30 years ago? Has life expectancy been going up? Has wealth been going up? And so forth. Very rarely do you see the question of progress framed that way, even though that's really the more intuitive way to frame the question. If you want a lot more on 
that, you should look at my essay, The Case for Black, the Case for Black Optimism, which I wrote many years ago for Quillette. I wrote like a 3,000 word essay going into detail about why I think benchmarking progress against the same group in the past makes more sense than benchmarking progress against the goal of closing gaps in the present. So you can see more about that if you're interested. I can carve out examples where diversity does matter. Like whether there's actual equal representation, I'm not sure that really ever matters because who is really bean counting in this way? But in general, there are situations where racial diversity does matter. And I, I've, I think I've talked about this in a Q&A before. It matters where it is an essential component of doing an important job. It's like where the job of an important institution can't be done except by a racially diverse group of people. Well, then I can see the case for diversity mattering. So, for example, policing. If you're going to police a mixed-race neighborhood or a black neighborhood and all the cops are white, that seems like a recipe for disaster because, you know, it, it just it creates, it sets up a situation where a community feels like they are being policed by people that have no connection to them. And the accusations of racism are just, you know, almost guaranteed to make it actually harder to police and protect that community. So so that would be an exception I can think of. There may be others. There there almost certainly are some others. But I think they're they're rarer, they're far more rare than the areas where we are pretending that diversity is crucial or that racial equality of outcome is crucial when it's in fact not. Okay, next question. What do you think about the argument, I'm not a racist, my best friends are black? I consider it a valid argument, but I get laughed at when I discuss it with my friends. Okay, good question. I mean, to me, this is clearly a valid argument if you're operating on my definition of a best friend and my definition of a racist. So like uh, my definition of a racist is someone who really dislikes, for instance, black people because they're black. Like being black is enough for you to be on his wrong, on his bad side. How could a person like that actually have best friends who are black? And again, my definition of a best friend is someone, it's like practically family, right? It's, it's someone who you have chosen to intertwine your life with in a deep way. So insofar as you are really operating on those definitions, it is a totally sound argument. The problem is people have actually pretty loose definitions of both of those words. People have an incredibly loose definition of racism that would include people who, for instance, don't like affirmative action or don't agree with everything Black Lives Matter has put forth, who people who opposed defund the police were called racist. Anyone who voted for Donald Trump was called racist. So when you have grouped so many people in this category based on political beliefs, well then, yeah, then I guess having a black friend doesn't prevent you from being a racist, but that's just an absurd definition. That's an absurd expansion of a term that should be reserved for the actual racists, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, I guess as a secondary point, people do often speak loosely about best friends. You know, there's a kind of person that describes everyone as their best friend, and that has a way of cheapening that term, too. So if you're operating on rigorous definitions of these words, then yeah, it is a valid argument, and people shouldn't laugh at it. But Unfortunately, those words have been so degraded by overuse. On expansive definitions, the argument no longer runs through.